is another letter from Paul. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. About six months later, from what I can read, Paul, Silas, and Timbo to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Church of the Thessalonians is Jason. It's the chief women of the Greeks. It's these people and all the other converts since then. It's those whom we read about in Acts chapter 16 with whom Paul had bonded. They are real people. Grace unto you and peace from the dynamic duo. Verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. Remember uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3? He sent Timothy over there to see how their faith was doing. Well, they were smoking. And the charity of every one of you all towards each other abounds. Verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. The, the token means an evidence. The fact that they were enduring the trials by looking to God for strength was the evidence that he was working in them. Because adversity does not in and of itself produce character. Only when we meet adversity with faith and trust in God does it produce character. A lot of people jump off a building when adversity comes. All right? So, and so these guys were hanging in there and it was evidence of how God was working in them. That you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Yeah, because we'll be there because we're coming back over here. So there are very few references to the kingdom that Paul makes in his epistles, but keep it straight when he does. Verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Good. But is it in this life? Mm, not necessarily. Watch this. Verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Time word. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance. You know that, right? Now it's not the up arrow. It's the down arrow. Okay? Now watch. Taking vengeance on them who know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Same as the punishment. The punishment is the destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he will come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. In other words, because you believe the word we shared with you, you'll be there We'll be there. We'll be rejoicing. I can't even imagine what it'll be like. Verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. That's what God wants for you too. He has a lot of good pleasure of his goodness that he wants to do with you, for you, in you. Sure. You're loaded. And the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hang on to your seat. 
chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, beseech. We implore you. What's he going to be talking about? The Apostle Paul is imploring the brethren not to buy into the same kind of lies that are being told to Christians today about the end times. And so, he says, I beseech you, I implore you. It's a word with, with passion in it. And verses 1 to 10 are his fervent effort to correct the wrong doctrine that was already infiltrating the church. Sure, because as soon as God gives right doctrine, the devil is going to come with wrong doctrine. Paul actually wrote Thessalonians, according to most scholars, in the early 50s. So they were the first of the epistles written. But in the structure and the order, they come at the end. Because we read that after he wrote those, then they reached out with the word and all kinds of stuff happened after that. So it was about maybe 16 years, 15 years later that Paul died. Most people say he was martyred somehow. And then for the next, by certainly by the end of the first century, the truth of the church epistles, the sacred secret, the rapture, who you are in Christ. Oh, for heaven's sake, just gone, basically gone, because you can read very little from about 70 to 110 A.D. There's not much information, but when the thread of, the, you know, kind of went underground back here comes up, it's so different in so many ways. And some of these great truths took centuries to be rediscovered. But they're right here in the Word. Now look what he says in verse 1. I beseech you, brothers, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. That word, that verb, gathering together, appears only one other time. You can look it up. It's Hebrews 10.25. And it talks about forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. Talking about fellowship among Christians. What a cool duo. When a word appears only two times in Scripture, number one, it's a short word study. Number two, it often makes a very powerful point. Think about it. Hebrews 10.25 is talking about fellowship in this life with believers. 2 Thessalonians 2.1, the only other use of the word, is talking about the gathering together of all believers. So you could say, as I once heard, that fellowship now is supposed to be the sweetest thing this side of the gathering together, which is going to be sweet. Verse 2, so that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter supposedly from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't let anybody tell you that you missed the rapture. Let's keep reading. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, this unfolding after the gathering together, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. I am going to show you that the falling away, which is a very erroneous translation, is the rapture 
of the church. It is the instantaneous disappearance of every Christian because it is saying that the day of Christ, usually called the day of the Lord, will not and cannot happen until the church is taken out. The Antichrist cannot and will not come to power until you and I are out of his way because right now we are holding him back. Here we go. We'll keep reading. Now, let's look at this word falling away. It's used only two places in the entire Bible. It's the word apostasia. Apostasy would be the English word that we would derive from this. Apo means away from, and then the other part of the word, the root, is to stand, to stand away from. The only other use of the word is Acts 21.21, where it's translated that they forsook Moses. To forsake someone is to stand away from him, in essence. Only two uses. Again, short word study. But when you have only two places to look at to determine the proper translation of a word, the context plays a major role. And I'm going to show you for sure in the context that this is talking about the gathering together. It's not talking about some kind of falling away of believers. Not at all. I'll show you. Watch. Let's keep reading. Follow the yellow brick road here. Except there come a, I'm going to translate it, departure. Hang on. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist is called a number of different things in the Bible, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God. Remember we read about the abomination of desolation as uh, Daniel, Jesus talked about that. Remember? Okay. That's right here. That's what this is talking about. So that he, there will be a temple built or rebuilt for this period of time. Sure. Yes, because when the church of the body of Christ is taken out, 3 minus 1 equals 2. And God's economy that was Jews and Gentiles back here will again be only two kinds of folks. And the Jews will have a temple. He's going to sit in the temple and he's going to say, I'm God. Verse 5, remember you not? Don't you remember that I was with you? I told you this stuff. And now... You know what withholds. Some Bibles say what holds him back. This son of perdition, all that. What holds him back that he might be revealed in his time at the right moment. It'll be the wrong moment for the world, but that's what it's talking about. And some say until his time comes. Verse 7 will prove what I was talking about in verse 3, that it should be translated departure. Look at this. Don't you just love the word? For the mystery of iniquity does already work. How many have noticed? Yeah. <clears throat> Only he, you could put it in quotes if you want to. Hey, what does Ephesians 2.15 call the church? One new Man, the body of Christ. That is exactly what's in view right here. Only he, it's you and I, who now holds him back, will hold him back until he be taken out of the way. That's the departure of verse 3, context. It's awesome. How cool is that? 
And then, verse 8, shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders people talking about, is so and so the Antichrist. Well, what about this guy or that guy or whoever you don't like? I think my neighbor is the Antichrist. Wait a minute. Get a chart, get a life. The Antichrist cannot show up until the church is gone. That's what it says. That's what it means. And don't let anybody twist your brain about that. By the way, remember the verse that we read when he said, verse 2, back to verse 2 for a moment, chapter 2, verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled by anybody telling you that you missed the rapture and now you're in the tribulation or the kingdom or some other thing. Think about it. What would you have to believe to be freaked out by the teaching that you missed the rapture and you're now in the day of the Lord and so forth? You'd have to believe in a pre-trib rapture. That's another evidence of the pre-trib rapture of the church. That's kind of cool. Okay, back to verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Did they have a choice? Sure they had a choice. We know God's not running a big puppet show. Listen, how many people believe that? Most people. God's in control. Even atheists seem to believe that. It's insane. Please. Let's get with the program of the word. Uh, verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's the only verse I know of in the church epistles that is like the idea that we explain in great detail in our book, Don't Blame God, and in the class One Day with the Creator about how God seems to say that he is in, uh, responsible for evil or doing something. And really, we know in the Old Testament, the language is that the devil is really doing it. God could not reveal the devil to them. It was their choices. Even in the Old Testament, that's plain, and it'll be plain here too. And that's what we're going to read in the next verse that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's not God's fault that people are broken upon him when they try to run over him. Over here, we had a bit of a rainstorm. We had the flood. Did God send the flood? Of course he sent the flood to save his plan of the baby and so forth. But was God the cause of the flood? Absolutely not. Sin was the cause of the flood. The flood was God's righteous and resourceful response to the free will choices of people. And so, they made a choice, these people, and all people throughout all ages, everybody that's ever lived, the billions of people, each person says either yes or no to God and or Christ. You can say yes. And then I'm talking exclamation points. That's how you walk it out. Okay? Verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, little pronoun. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief 
of the truth. Whose choice was it to believe? Yours. And you said, yes. We've already covered this, talked about it. The elect chosen. He called everyone. He chose those who said yes. Everybody was invited. But a lot of people didn't come to the party by their free will. Verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. Sacred, secret, church epistles. To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father, one plus one, still makes two, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. He's writing to the Thessalonians, and they are in the middle of persecution. And he says, may the Lord and God comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. You got to match your words with your deeds. In other words, if you don't do that, the Bible says you're a hypocrite wearing a mask. You say one thing, do another. Now, we're never going to be perfect, but God looks on our heart and we want him to see something good when he looks on our heart that we desire. We're trying to be perfect. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. If you like what we do in this ministry, if you like this seminar, if you like the class One Day with the Creator, please pray that the word of the Lord will, be, will have free course and be glorified. We want to move the word over the world. Yeah. Even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered. See, prayer helps. From unreasonable and wicked men, for all have not faith. Duh. Verse 3. But the Lord, who is that? Jesus is faithful, who will establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Think about his relationship, his heart with those people. It's amazing. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Who's he talking about? The people spreading the lies that were distorting the truth of the administrations in Scripture. That's who he's talking about. See the word tradition there? It appears 13 times in the Scripture. Three times it's good stuff. Ten times it's bad stuff. Like we read in Matthew uh, chapter 9 in our class one day with the Creator. You have made the Word of God of no effect by your tradition. You're making up stuff. It means, the word tradition simply means something passed on from one person to another. Some, and you can pass on the word, the truth. For yourselves know how you ought to imitate, one more time, imitate us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly. By the way, Jesus is right in the verse above that. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Listen, it's not wrong to know you're right. Yeah, you should know how you're behaving, right? So if you go to someone's house for dinner and you have nice manners and you're, uh, you know, pleasant and so forth, you can walk out and say, yeah, I wasn't a boor, right? Okay, so that's what he said. And he's reminding them of his behavior. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. In other words, we didn't mooch. 
but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. I've explained this, and he's going to be more specific in the coming verses. Some of them weren't working when they could have, and therefore they were a drain on the other people. Verse 9, look at this. Not because we don't have the power or the authority to be paid for our work. Not by forcing and coercing people to give you money, but by the principle of the workman is worthy of his hire, muzzle not the ox that treads out the corn, and so forth. Being a minister of the gospel is a noble occupation, just as noble as other occupations for which you are currently being paid. Not because we don't have the power, but to make ourselves an example for you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, then he shouldn't eat. That would cause some people to get a job when they're starving. Get a job. Okay, there you go. Verse 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. That's also the kind of people he was telling them to avoid until those people got their act together. And certainly not to let those people influence them in the wrong direction. Verse 12. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But you, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. That's what 1 Corinthians 5, 5 is talking about when it says commit someone unto Satan. There's all kinds of whacked out stuff about that. It means kick them out of the fellowship until they get their act together. By so doing, number one, you're taking away poison from the fellowship, but also you're showing them, hopefully they'll say, wow, I really like those people. They're pretty good people. I, I need to get my act together. That he may be ashamed. God wants people to repent, to turn around, to stop sinning. And the body of Christ is too important. So, what did I talk about earlier? You gotta align yourself with somebody. And I would be darn sure that the people you're aligning yourself with are genuine. And that's gonna require a little effort on your part. You're gonna have to listen, you're gonna have to look, you're going to have to uh, perhaps get to know them, see how they act, find out about them, whatever you got to do, because the Word says we're supposed to imitate those who imitate Christ. Verse 15, yet count him not as an enemy, but nuke, nuthateo, nuthateo him, admonish him as a brother, like, listen, you know good and well that's not how you want to act. That's not how you should act. Now, you are not welcome here anymore until you change. And we'll help you, whatever we can do, but no more. That's what it means. That's what it says. And when you identify people who are not walking the talk and you still hang out with them, I don't think it's healthy. Verse 16, my Bible says, benediction. Verse 16, listen to how Paul signs off. Remember when he was with them in Acts chapter 17 and all that they went through together, his pal Jason, the rest of them. Now the Lord of peace, that's Jesus, himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Apparently someone uh, was a scribe. He dictated. The other guy wrote, and Paul always signed it at the end. The grace 
of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And those are the last two of the church epistles, replete with references to our true hope, the gathering together of every Christian on the earth to meet the Lord in the air. If you're not a Christian, you can confess Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and you'll be in group one, please. And in the meantime, you'll be filled with the power of Christ. You will be part of the body of Christ, the sacred secret whereby Jesus diversifies himself all over the world. He has the personal curriculum for you. And he wants you to maximize the potential that you have, which is far greater than you realize. It's far greater than I realize, but it's not far greater than he realizes. So I love you. I appreciate you taking your time in this seminar, and I hope you will encourage others to watch it. I hope you will support the Living Truth Fellowship with your uh, financial sharing, offering, whatever you want to call it, money. That's what we're looking for. Because money buys time. And time, when it's invested in people who have abilities and heart, can do a lot of things to help people. So please do pray that the word that we speak has free course and that we can reach out around the world together and if I can ever do anything for you, don't hesitate to call on me. I know I speak for our trustees, our elders, our staff. We love you. We are so thankful to God that we could present something like this just to understand what's on this chart. It's a miracle. I was just bebopping through life, okay? Loaded with baseball, basketball, football. All of a sudden, God said, yo, get a life. So... I got a chart and a life. And thank God for that. So bless you. I'd like to close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father and dear Lord, thank you so much for this precious person, for his life, her life. Thank you that you have called them and that you have set a hope in their heart, the hope of your appearing and then we will see you face to face and forever be with you and with a lot of wonderful folks. And in the meantime, Lord, we're living in a dark world. It's getting worse and worse. And help us to have courage. Help us to overcome fear. Keep us healthy. Keep us prosperous. Meet our needs so that we can serve you. Because we know that in so doing, we will lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven that you will be blessed to give us when we see your smiling face. Amen. God bless you. I love you.